Uh, we're very fortunate today to have the Commandant of the Coast Guard with us. You all must know that at one time the United States had only one military service, and that was the Coast Guard. I think it was called the Federal Revenue Cutter Service. Revenue Cutter Service. Revenue Cutter Service at the time. We decided we didn't need an Army and a Navy, but we did need revenue. And, uh, and it was the Coast Guard that, that ensured that. And I think it's a bit of a, an insight into the unique qualities of the Coast Guard, because the Coast Guard is more than a military service. It's a, it's a law enforcement service, and that makes it absolutely unique in the American landscape. It gives it unusual authorities, it gives it important insights, and it's really a leader behind the scenes that most Americans don't appreciate and understand. And uh, Admiral Sukunf is going to go through some of that today with uh, his discussion with us about this unfolding dimension of cybersecurity for in the maritime domain. And he's doing some very creative thinking about that. We're very fortunate that he's willing to share some of this with us. Uh, I, before we, I turn to him, uh, let me just say, I'm, uh, we, before when we have public events, we always give a little safety announcement. I'm your responsible safety officer. I'm going to make sure everybody is safe here today. If we have to uh, evacuate this space, more likely than not, we'll go through this uh, exit door behind me. The exit stairs right there. We're going to go downstairs. If it looks like it's best to go the back, we'll go across the street and we'll meet at the National Geographic. They've got a nice courtyard in there. Otherwise, if we go to the front, we'll go across to the park. And I will take head count there, and then we'll try to figure out how to entertain you once we get there. But please follow my directions, okay? That's the one thing I ask. Uh, again, I would say we're very grateful Admiral, that you're here, this remarkable service, the Coast Guard, which is, uh, is at its battle stations every day. And America is the great beneficiary of that. So would you please, with your warm applause, welcome the Commandant of the Coast Guard, Admiral Sir Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon. And it just seems like yesterday I was here addressing a similar audience when we rolled out our Western Hemisphere strategy. And I'm going to come back to that later on in this discussion. But when I came into this job a little bit over a year ago, uh, I recognized the fact that we operate in a number of domains. And obviously, we've been operating on the sea since 1790. Uh, but I remember back in 1982, uh, and I was standing, I was a search and rescue coordinator, and a desktop computer arrived. And it had a game called Rats on it. Uh, and so we would play rats on it, and we said, I'm not sure what this is going to do. It gets in the way. It disrupts our operations. Uh, I had a clerical staff of about seven or eight, and they all manned IBM Selectric uh, computers. Uh, we were state-of-the-art at the time, uh, but we were anything but when it came to networked and information sharing across a global domain. So fast forward now in 2015. If you show up for work today and your Android phone doesn't work, your iPad doesn't work, if you're working in a secure environment and you can't share networked information, then you might as well pack it up and go home. Uh, and so the Coast Guard has evolved since 1982 and obviously since 1790, uh, but we never addressed you know, how, do is, how do we operate in this domain. So when I first look at cyber, cyber is not a mission. It's a domain that we operate. If you own an iPhone, an Android device, an iPad, any wireless device, then you operate in the cyber domain. We are one and all cyber operators. And so that is a fundamental skill set for every member of the Coast Guard. In order for them to be, be operators uh, or maintainers, uh, intelligence specialists, they have to be savvy in the cyber domain as well. So as we looked at how do you develop a, a cyber strategy, I, I look at it not just from a Coast Guard aspect, uh, but really from a private sector, a public sector, how would you address cyber in the 21st century? And so we came up with three domains uh, that, that are not unique to the Coast Guard, but to anybody who can spell the word cyber. And it really begins with, you, know, you need to defend your cyberspace. So what does that mean for the United States Coast Guard? Uh, we have very distributed workforces. 
Um, and and our, our weakest link in all of our systems, it's not our architecture. The Coast Guard operates primarily in the dot mill domain. Uh, we operate under dot mill, but we work across the dot gov, the dot com, and even the dot edu domains. So we work across a number of domains, but when it comes to protecting this domain of ours, the weakest link in all of this is my human resource capital. It comes down to what I call cyber hygiene. Uh, and we see that not just within the Coast Guard, but we see that throughout every organization. Uh, when I visited an LNG facility, and, and I'll get to this a little bit later in terms of protecting infrastructure, uh, and, and I talked to that facility operator, they have fences, they have lighting, cameras, everything, and I said, it, it looks like you have an impregnable facility, uh, but guess what, you're not. And they said, how so? I said, well, who do you have you know, protecting your facility internally and externally against zeros and ones that, that may threaten to take down your facility? Uh, so it is a daily occurrence in the U.S. Coast Guard uh, where we have a, an internal patch that we need to apply because somebody took a shortcut. Uh, they, they are smarter than the guidance that we provide them that say you shall not do this. Uh, but folks go ahead and do that and then they compromise our entire system. So as we put our cyber strategy together, we said, well, what workforce do I need? What subject matter experts do we need within the Coast Guard? Uh, because we don't have a cyber specialty. Uh, but we've created just recently a cyber command within the U.S. Coast Guard. Now it's 70 people. It may not sound like a lot, um, but they can have awareness across our full operating domain in cyber within the Coast Guard. So daily they can look at where those potential leaks are, malware that may be introduced, and then go out and fix it. Uh, and so I can do that with 70 people, but I reprogrammed uh, different specialties within the Coast Guard to create this cyber group of experts of 70, but I never built it into my program of record. Uh, and when I tell these 70 folks, I need for them to stay in this job for perpetuity. Uh, don't do this job for three or four years like we often do in the military. Uh, and then when you get tired of that job, you take up another hobby. Uh, you really need to be specialized, and especially in this field of work, because it changes so rapidly uh, that you need to have folks keeping pace with the changes that take place around us. Now, just think when Tom Friedman wrote the book, The World is Flat. He wrote that book in 2005, and then a year later, uh, he had to add a, a special appendix to it, and then he just recently wrote The World is Flat 3.0. But in 2005, the world Twitter, Flickr, and Facebook did not exist. So I mean, that's how fast technology is changing. And so if you think you could have somebody doing part-time cyber work and then come back four or five years later and pick up where they left off, they've missed the train. Uh, so this strategy helps me drive the human resource capital that I need to stay conversant in cyber and to stay one step ahead rather than three steps behind this ever-evolving domain that we must operate. So, so protecting our cyber domain within the Coast Guard, very internally focused, is, is a key, key requirement for me as the Commandant. The second area within the strategy is enabling operations in the cyber domain. And let me just give you an example of just over a week ago, uh, we were able to interdict uh, six go-fast vessels over a 36-hour period over an area the size of North America. These go fast are not much bigger than the stage that I stand on. And I don't have an armada of ships out there. Trust me, I wish I did, but I don't. But I was able to vector aircraft and ships across an area of North America. I'm talking all of Canada, all the United States, right down to the Panama Canal distributed over that area, and we were able to interdict all six of those vessels and remove over four tons of cocaine within a 36-hour period. That would not be possible without our ability to operate in the cyber domain. And it's not just the Coast Guard operating in that cyber domain. In this case, it's the entire intelligence community. It's our international partners as well. And then how do I get real-time information into the hands of operators in advance of an adversary that clearly does not want to be found by the Coast Guard. On the flip side, we certainly use cyber for search and rescue. 
Uh, we encourage mariners on all vessels, especially going on international voyages, to carry a beacon. And if you're in distress, I will find you. Uh, but I will not find you if there is a disturbance in the cyber cloud, if you will. Uh, and so it's a key enabler for us to go out and save lives at sea. Uh, we have uh, an armada of ships, if you've been following the news, heading out the Straits of Juan de Fuca as I speak. Uh, yesterday, there were ha we had protesters and kayakers hanging on anchor chains uh, as Royal Dutch Shell awaits the final permitting process for them to drill in the Chukchi Sea in a very remote part of the world. Now, what if something happens up in the Chukchi Sea? One, I'm sending an armada of, ship of Coast Guard ships up there as well. Um, but if I need to send in reinforcements, if I can't operate in the cyber domain, uh, we could see a catastrophic failure, loss of life, a major oil spill. And when I go back five years ago, during the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, I was the federal on-scene coordinator for that for, for seven months. And the public imaging of this really wasn't a home run for the Coast Guard at day one. And so we worked with NOAA, and they developed uh, an application. It was called the Emergen Res Emergency Response Management Application. And you could use all of the elements of G GPS encrypted photos. You could provide about five layers of information. Uh, and then we decided, hey, let's put this out on the internet so people could navigate through it, not wait for the next CNN newscast, but they can manipulate this information and assimilate what is happening with this oil spill and, and not hear it from me because they don't trust me, um, perhaps. Um, but we put it out on the internet, and within 12 hours, we had 200,000 hits. I said, well, that's not too bad. Uh, the next day, it was 2.5 million. Uh, and then the public trust level went up as transparency of information went up as well. But again, I would not be able to enable that operation if I wasn't able to fully enable the cyber domain as well. So it applies in disaster response, it applies in search and rescue, it applies in law enforcement. So it really applies across each and every one of our skill sets uh, as I look at where, and most importantly, how the Coast Guard operates in the 21st century. Now the final piece, the third, so we, we do things in threes, just like sermons. Uh, so we protect our infrastructure, we enable operations, then we protect outward looking our national critical infrastructure in the maritime domain. Now why would we be interested in this? If you go back to the Maritime Transportation Security Act of 2002, it provided sweeping authorities for the US Coast Guard to enhance physical security at all of our facilities that do international trade. There's over 3,500 facilities in the United States and the vessels that call upon them. And so facilities were required to generate facility security plans, as did vessels, and there was grant money, fences went up, cameras went up, TWIC cards were issued, um, but within that security vulnerability is cyber as well. Now if you look back about three months ago, there was a work slowdown on the West Coast through the ILWU. Uh, and I happened to be flying over LA Long Beach right at the height of this, and there were 46 container ships at anchor offshore. Now about a third of those container ships were destined to New York, uh, the containers themselves, and then those containers were destined for Bremerhaven, Amsterdam, and to the EU to feed their just-in-time inventory. The other third of those were destined for the Rust Belt, the manufacturing floors of the United States. And so when you look at a port slowdown and then a ripple effect of that in terms of our global economy, this was a, a man-made work, a man-made slowdown in our maritime commerce. But every second, Intel Corporation produces five billion, with a B, five billion transistors per second. Now say maybe 0.001% of those transistors has malware. That still means you have over a million transistors with malware that have now been introduced into the cyber domain. Now, if you go to a container facility, uh, many of these operate on SCADA network systems. About 90% of that terminal is run on automated systems, very dependent on a GPS signal as well. 
And 90% of our world's, com world's commerce, our nation's commerce, goes through these very same seaports. So you've got 90% commerce, 90% automation. What if there's a slowdown in the maritime domain due to a cyber event? And we might ask ourselves, well, what is the likelihood of that ever happening? Well, it's, it's great. I, I can't make this up. You know, we have Sony. Now we have what's happening with, with OPM. And in many cases, this is just not providing good cyber hygiene at some of these facilities that now make them vulnerable to infiltration by folks that may want to cause that unit harm. I look at the potential that the United States sits on right now. We sit on 20% of the world's natural gas, and we are just now building the infrastructure to export LNG. And a market niche that the United States has right now is in the Asia Pacific market. At a point in time when the Panama Canal expansion project will be complete next year, it's 180 feet wide at its expansion point. It will take ships initially up to 160 feet wide. It will take LNG carriers through the Panama Canal. A huge growth potential when you look at what is currently a trade imbalance for the United States where we can reset some of that balance. Uh, but when you think of the United States producing, now exporting LNG, and what is modern warfare going to look like in the 21st century? Do we have adversaries among us today at a national level? Forget about the non-state actors, but at a national level. And I think we can all answer that question. And so right now, who has the natural gas market niche in the EU and in parts of the Asia Pacific region? It's not us. It's Russia. And so what if we're now taking some of that market share? And what if tensions escalate between us and Russia? Uh, does Russia conduct electronic warfare against our military? Or might they want to conduct electronic warfare against our critical infrastructure? So that is another example where we need to protect our infrastructure. And there's a case not that long ago, a mobile offshore drilling unit. Uh, they rely very heavily on dynamic positioning systems. Uh, and this mobile offshore drilling unit, it drove off the well site because malware was introduced into the server because employees aboard this MODU thought they could access anything on the internet, and malware was introduced, and now you have this mobile offshore drilling unit, think the deep water horizon, because it's in 7,000 feet of water, drifts off. Fortunately, the blowout preventer kicked in and it shut it down, um, but we've seen examples where this has happened in the maritime domain as well. So protecting this infrastructure, uh, absolutely critical, and again, the Coast Guard has very unique authorities when it comes to that. So, so let's look at this mobile offshore drilling unit that, that's driven off. Now, right now, there's no requirement for them to notify the Coast Guard. Uh, and so we've done a lot of outreach and are continuing to do so with our maritime stakeholders. Uh, that, that if you see or, more importantly, sense something, say something. Uh, we have area maritime security committees at all our major ports. Uh, just last, not even a week ago, I met with all of the stakeholders in the ports of New Jersey and New York. Uh, we had the commissioner of police there as well, uh, over 300 people in attendance. And so we talked about cyber. Uh, and, you know, in fact, their awareness that if they see something, notify that sector commander. Uh, what that sector commander in turn will do is notify our Coast Guard Cyber Command, who in turn will notify within the Department of Homeland Security, we have the, the National Cyber Center Communications Information Center. It's the NCIC. Uh, it's easier to say the, the acronym than it is the long name. And the Coast Guard has watch standards at, the, at, this, at the NCIC as well. And what this does, it looks at the various sectors in the United States, a sector being maritime, financial, energy. In this case, you know, we have an anomaly in the maritime sector. And say it's, in this case, maybe it's New York. And then suddenly, now it's in LA Long Beach. And now it's in Oakland. And now it's in Tacoma, Washington. And what we're seeing play out is a synchronized attack against our maritime transportation system. And so now the NKIC has this awareness is that we are under attack, and we better alert our financial systems, our energy sectors, and others. And so this is right now an awareness. And then what do you do now that you have awareness? 
Uh, the Coast Guard is also integrated into U.S. Cyber Command, and I have a Coast Guard flag officer that works over there. And so there's a very strong lash up with DOD. And at this point, it comes down to assigning attribution. Who did it? And the who did it piece is really challenging for us, quite honestly. Maybe you can pinpoint a transmitter from where that signal was sent. But you can't verify that, that somebody sitting under the roof of that transmitter was, in fact, the sender. Someone could have remotely accessed that transmitter from another remote device and set up that other transmitting site as the perpetrator, whereas the true adversary remains unknown. So you know, assigning attribution is not necessarily a, a black and white regime. And then once you do assign attribution, then what do you do about it? And so when we looked at the Sony attacks, and I was involved in some of these discussions, and, and they go up to an extremely high level when it comes to what do we do about it. And so if you look at mutual assured destruction, if we counterattack, what might somebody come back with us? And will they look for that other chink in our armor? Um, you know, it may not be going toe-to-toe -to -toe with dreadnoughts, but looking for the weakest link in the chain. And so when you look at cyber, where are the weakest links in the chain across our entire cyber domain? And that's a bit challenging for us to be able to determine with absolute certainty that we know where every one of those weak links are. Recognizing that the biggest weak links are the many operators that we have in that cyber domain that don't exercise good cyber hygiene, if you will. So those are the challenges, those are the opportunities, uh, but as I stand here as the Commandant of the Coast Guard, I said, well, I can't do this alone. And so when we rolled out the cyber strategy, uh, we work closely with the Department of Justice. FBI has a key role in cyber. We work closely with the Department of Defense um, and U.S. Cyber Command. We work very closely, obviously, with our department, and then within NPPD, uh, who ultimately holds the, the cyber watch, if you will, for the Department of Homeland Security. So this was not a go off into a dark room and come out with a cyber strategy, but let's crosswalk this as a template that others may look to follow this very same template of how do we approach cyber in the 21st century, but recognizing that this is a domain uh, that's, that is going to be as natural as breathing as I look at the future of the Coast Guard and not the Coast Guard of 1982 nor the Coast Guard of 1790. So with that, I really look forward to opening it up to question and answer. And again, I thank each and every one of you. I especially thank you for opening the, the, the doorway <laughs> here so we can provide seats to others. And I know we have folks out in the audience as well. So Jim, I'm going to turn it over to Great. you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm Jim Lewis. I work here. Here's the drill. Uh, you get to ask questions. I'll kick it off. You people over there, since we didn't expect you, I may not see you because of this podium, so send up a flare or shout or throw something, but this is a question and answer period. Um, I'm going to start with, I have a couple questions, and you brought up something that I was going to ask about, and I was a little surprised. In the olden days, uh, sometimes it was hard to cooperate with some of the regional or local authorities, like uh, Port Authority of New York and New Jersey or NYPD. Um, what's your, just to pick two, um, what's your strategy now for dealing with this? What's the reception you've gotten from the big ports, from the guys you have to work with? How's that going? Yeah, Jim, I'll, I'll go back even bigger than that. Uh, two weeks ago, I was in Oslo, Norway, uh, at, a, at a North shipping conference. Uh, we had the entire EU represented every major shipper. We had about 3,000 people. Uh, and we talked about cyber. Uh, as they asked me, what do I see as an evolving trend on the seas? And they oftentimes look to the US Coast Guard because many times you know, we help set those standards uh, that are then applied universally and globally. Uh, and when I mentioned cyber, uh, there, there was silence in the room. Uh, everyone put their iPhones down. Uh, and, and I heard whispering among you know, the, the CEOs to their staffs and saying, what are, what are we doing about cyber? Um, so people realize that this isn't a chicken little, the sky is falling, but this is, first of all, what are we doing to educate our workforce? Uh, and then second, you know, what are we doing to grow the competencies within our workforce 
so that we can defend our network and have situational awareness of what's happening around us. So we're seeing that internationally, and we're certainly seeing it at the port levels uh, who have gone to great lengths to literally harden their defenses, their fences, the lighting, the cameras, and everything. In fact, if there's a hole in the fence or someone sneaks onto that facility, there is a requirement for them to notify the Coast Guard that there has been a security breach. The reason they notify us is that if there's more than one of these events, it might be part of a coordinated attack. So the other piece we have to come to grips with is, well, this is now the invisible intrusion, the virtual intrusion as well, and sensitizing industry that it's in their best interest to work with us so we can elevate this to a higher level if this is part of a much broader coordinated attack uh, against our infrastructure. Uh, so I would answer that question with one word, incentivized. Good. Thank you. Um, let me do another one, which is that when you look over the last uh, few years, you've seen the other services uh, experiment with organizational models. Navy merged uh, in telecommunications at one point, and they're all playing with different ways to organize for cybersecurity and cyber warfare. Um, how are you thinking about that? What models did you look to? Did you, whose experience did you draw on? Uh, we really drew on the uh, Department of Defense, the, you know, the U.S. Cybercom model. Uh, because cyber, unlike many of our other operations, we usually define them geographically. Uh, well, this is global. Uh, and, and so you have to have global awareness. Uh, and it really is, it, it's an operating element, but it's also a mission support element. So for the Coast Guard, right now it fits most naturally, with nation, uh, naturally within our, uh, what we call our J6 component of the Coast Guard, which, which is not unlike where it fits within other organizations as well. How do you think the organization will evolve? Will it be more people, more training? What's the mix of civilian versus uh, uniformed? Um, what are you thinking about for the future of this? Creating it on the fly overnight, <laughs> uh, and uh, it was much quicker for me to reprogram enlisted billets or just designate some of our enlisted and officers that, that had the, the aptitude that said, you know, you are now assigned to Coast Guard Cyber Command. And now that you're assigned there, this is going to be your career path for four years to come. Certainly, it lends itself to civilianization. Uh, it, it's an evolving trade craft, if you will. And if anything, on first impact, every entity says, I've got to have cyber. Uh, we need to be able to leverage partnerships before we go too far out and think we have to do it all ourselves. And so I look, first of all, within our Department of Homeland Security. How do we leverage that partnership within DOD? How do we leverage that partnership as well? Uh, so I'm looking at this as a very incremental approach as other entities build up their cyber capability uh, and build upon those partnerships rather than trying to be all things to all people with, with a fairly lowly funded organization such as the U.S. Coast Guard. We had Admiral Ruffhead here a couple years ago when he was still CNO, right at the end of his tenure. And he said that one of the things he ran into was a couple of the things you brought up. The first was creating a career path so that it wasn't, you know, some guy was in the cyber unit and then he went to be a sysadmin on a ship. The other thing he ran into was maybe the people who would be attracted to cyber might not, and Mike, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, might not um, fit the normal Navy pattern and maybe he'd have to loosen up a little bit on some of the, you know, like routine sea deployments and things like that. What have you found when you went to the workforce and told them, hey, guess what, this is your career? Did they volunteer? Did you select them? Um, how's that going? I would say they gravitated towards this. Huh. Uh, when I saw this as, you know, the big thing coming, coming their way uh, as an opportunity, uh, their hmm. concern was, you know, this would be, uh, you know, the, the flavor of the week uh, in that they have just, you know, driven down a dead-end road from a career standpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, my biggest challenge is I look at these very bright young individuals. You know, they are going to be, you know, subject to headhunters from across the enterprise. Uh, my sailor of the year uh, in, in our Coast Guard headquarters uh, grew up in the Ukraine. You know, he is, he, he's an E6 in the Coast Guard, hands down one of my top cyber operators right now. Uh, and, and I asked him, well, what if I send you off to just be an, an information technician specialist? And he goes, well, I have other offers. I really like what I'm doing, and, and I get to use the best stuff, the absolute best stuff in the U.S. government. So 
I'm going to keep this guy around. Uh, and, and the same thing, we have young lieutenants as well. Uh, you know, they really have a passion for this, not just an aptitude, but a no fooling passion for it. And, and if you have those two combined, then you've got all the winning ingredients for a, a, an A-class team. Okay. So uh, I'm very optimistic in terms of the human resource capital we have. What do you think your What do you think your biggest shortfall is? What would be the one thing if you had a magic wand you'd want to get? Well, with you know, I think any service chief would say we're we're flush in money, and, and we haven't found a good way to allocate it all. So no, you're thinking of the Air Force. No. no. <laughs> oh. So, uh, <laughs> you know, the reason I wanted the strategy is we need to build out a program of record. You know, it's a human resource capital. Yeah. There's, there's architecture. Uh, when you acquire new systems, you know, you need to think about cyber when you're acquiring new system, systems and then you're fielding those. Uh, you need to look at those systems. Who else do they interoperate with? Mm -hmm. And if they interoperate with, with others outside your domain, you know, what cyber safeguards do they have in place? So as you start looking at this, it touches every aspect of what we do every day in the Coast Guard. Let me see if anyone out in the, oh, we've got one right in front. Uh, could you identify yourself? And do me a favor, please keep your questions succinct. I know you will, but uh, identify yourself, succinct question, and then I've got more, so. Sydney Friedberg, Breaking Defense. Uh, Admiral, thank you for coming. Uh, do you need, or in fact, are you recommending at this point to the administration uh, a package of legal authorities for cyber about notification and so forth similar to what you already have from the system perspective. I keep on making an analogy, but I haven't used exactly to say outright the words, and this is our package, this is our plan, this is what we want Congress to enact ultimately. That's a great question. I'm glad you, you posed that because, you know, I just need awareness that, that a facility has a vulnerability. I don't even want to identify who that facility is. I clearly do not want, you know, Coast Guard officers and petty officers accessing those systems that, that may have personal, personal identifiable information, financially sensitive information, I do not have a need to know. And they have a right to privacy in protecting that information. Um, but but are they, if they are subjected to a coordinated attack, if you will, a hack, uh, that, that then threatens our national security, I, I need to have awareness of that. Now, when we report up, I have no need to report which facility is it that, that's under attack. And so nothing will disincentivize a for-profit entity of, of being named in public uh, that now their systems are vulnerable. Look what happened to Target when they were named. Uh, so I'm very mindful of, of what the impact of that would be to shareholders as well. So anonymity is certainly a key component of that, which means I wouldn't need legislative authority. Uh, but really more operating policy uh, of bringing that information forward. Okay. Uh, we've got uh, one in the back and then one in the front, two in the front. Good afternoon, sir. Mo Smolskis, currently with Blue Star Strategies, but during I'm in the middle of my application process for OCS. So heading back to New London, hopefully. I'll see you right afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> um, and my question is, you talk a lot about the cyber hygiene piece, um, and for those of us who may not be cyber people specifically, are there plans in place for the Coast Guard to enact trainings um, or other sorts of things to kind of push this idea along? Because all of us are obviously using computers and everything, and, and we'll be involved at some point. We need to do more with our training. Uh, and so ironically, much of this training is online. So uh, it really needs to be physical, and, and our workforce needs to have an appreciation of, of what a compromise does, uh, one, in terms of the impact to our operations, and then in real cost of what, it, what the real cost is of applying a patch uh, because someone failed to exercise poor cyber hygiene. And so what's poor cyber hygiene? You know, you plug in your iPhone, you know, into your server at work to recharge it. Well, you know, you've just compromised that system. Uh, but we see that happen on, you know, from time to time on a near daily basis. So clearly we have more work to do when it comes to training. Okay. Uh, we've got a couple up front. Do I, Jacob, why don't you grab the one in the back and then we'll... Thank you. Um, Deanne Divis with Inside GNSS. We cover navigation, so my questions are navigation related. Uh, we've seen structured interference to the GPS signal in conflict zones interference with U.S. maritime facilities. 
Can you tell me, please, what the Coast Guard strategy, how it incorporates GPS and protection of the GPS signal, and the mobile drilling platform that you mentioned, that the, the cyber incident, was that related to navigation software, some element of navigation? Uh, that was related to um, a navigation system. And so right now, you, in some ways, you have a single point of failure with the GPS signal. Uh, commercially off the shelf, you, know, you, can, you can acquire a, a GPS jammer. It, it runs on a, a very low energy, a radius of maybe 30 feet. Uh, but you can compromise a GPS signal you know, using these devices. Uh, we, we've seen this occur in law enforcement applications uh, where uh, an individual may think there was a tran transducer uh, on their vessel, and so they would try to jam that signal. So that is a vulnerability. Uh, it's that same GPS timing system that runs our financial sector as well. So when you start looking at resiliency and redundancy, uh, they, there are some true vulnerabilities there. Going back to the MODU incident, uh, many of our mobile offshore drilling units not just rely on GPS signals, but they'll also put transducers on the seafloor. Uh, so it provides them at least a secondary backup uh, should they have a disruption in the GPS signal. Okay. And how does it fit into your strategy? Is there a GPS or a protective element in the strategy? Yeah, ours is truly a strategy in the sense, you know, I mean, the next piece is, you know, the, the many tentacles of how do you implement a strategy. Uh, but when you start looking at protecting infrastructure, critical infrastructure, single points of failure, uh, that would certainly be a key area of focus, uh, you know, the GPS signal when it comes to protecting critical infrastructure. GPS is a key enabler. It affects navigation, it affects financial sector, it affects a number of domains, the air domain as well when it comes to transportation. So, so GPS really does cut across the board. Ours looks just maritime, but clearly there's a need to take that to a, well, no pun intended, to a higher level. Okay, come on up. Uh, oh, that one right there. Hi, Steve Caldwell, former uh, director of GAO for Maritime Security Issues. Uh, Admiral, you mentioned the international na nature of this. Uh, obviously, we know a lot of the global fleet is not U.S. flagged. A lot of the world's biggest ports are not under your jurisdiction. You mentioned this uh, Norway event where, where you spoke about cyber. And then I know recently the IMO, uh, Maritime Safety Security Committee, had met to discuss some of these issues. So I just wondered where you think the trend is going in terms of, uh, say, global acceptance or consensus that that cyber is indeed part of uh, the ISPIS code? Good question. Right now, I, I don't see an appetite for bringing cyber into the ISPIS code. That being said, I, I see industry, as I said earlier, very incentivized uh, in the absence of waiting for an international standard uh, is to seek out what those standards are, uh, working in many cases with the private sector to harden their cyber defenses uh, and minimize their vulnerabilities. So, uh, this will probably be led by industry first, um, and they're not looking at IMO, at least not currently, to incorporate cyber into the ISPIS codes. I'm going to try a question. We can get somebody. We've got one in the front here, but while you're, the mic's coming up, um, if you had to sort of prioritize, what problem do you see more pressing for you? Do you see the safety problems, or do you see the law enforcement problems? I mean, we're, you're going to say both, but... Which one gets the most attention for you? Which one gives you the most heartburn? <laughs> there is no one answer to all of that because it really does cut across every one of our mission sets. And, and so if I were to answer that, I would say, well, I, I would much rather arrest people than save lives. Well, I want to do both. In, in fact, it's the same ships that are out there arresting people right now that I divert to go save lives. And then if there's a mass migration, then I divert them to go do that. So this really cuts across every one of our mission sets, and, and it just depends you know, which one is the most critical at any given point in time. Um, but this can compromise our ability to do what our Coast Guard does 24 by 7. Great. Uh, we had one in the front. Coming up, this is Lawrence Carew from International Energy Partnership. Uh, Secretary, Navy Secretary Mavis is making a big push on energy for his uh, ports, and I think, aren't you involved in all that kind of stuff too? Exactly. Yeah, I mean, this is a big problem. Uh, it's a big opportunity, as I see it right now. 
uh, in the energy sector, and we've actually incorporated this into our Western Hemisphere strategy because there's a big chunk of that talks about facilitating commerce. And, and as I mentioned, you know, the, the LNG, the export potential that the U.S. has right now. Uh, by most estimate, by the year 2020, the U.S. will be a net exporter of energy. Uh, in the last year and a half, you know, we, we reached that break-even point where we now produce more oil than we import, and that trend will increase. Now, it's a very volatile industry, and, and we understand. As the price of oil comes down, there's less exploration. As it comes back up, all of a sudden, you know, we're in another wave of ex exploration. But when I just look at the fracking, shale oil, you know, the, the potential of that, at least for the next 30 years, if, if not longer. So I need to make sure that the Coast Guard is postured for this growth sector in the maritime industry that is going to be very cyber dependent going forward. So all of these are, are interrelated. I thought you, the point you made about uh, large unfriendly nations heavily dependent on oil exports for their revenue being um, potential opponents was particularly interesting. Hypothetical. Yeah. Um, we have one over there. Uh, Zach Biggs with Jane's. Uh, Admiral, you were talking about the process of building that force of 70 and how you looked for people with aptitude when it came to cyber and were able to move them around before building a broader program. What were you looking for when you're looking for those, that aptitude? I know there's been a lot of discussion of how do you find cyber talent, how do you identify it? What was the measure, the metrics that you were using to try to figure out who would be good in those roles? You know, that, that's another great question. In 1973, when I went to the Coast Guard Academy, uh, I was issued a slide rule. Uh, and then a year later, uh, pocket calculators came out. So I didn't have the right questions to ask. Uh, so I surround myself with the people that know how to ask those very same smart questions. One of them sitting in the front row with me right now, we're Admiral Marshall Lytle. He's my uh, chief information officer. So it's folks like him that I'm indebted to not him, but he reaches down, and when to be an effective admiral, you've got to be able to connect at every level in your organization. Um, and, and so I'm indebted to folks like Marshall uh, that, that are able to take the pulse of our workforce and find this great talent that exists within our workforce. And then when it doesn't, how do I recruit it? And then how do I retain it? Um, so I'm in the recruit retain business right now, but we've gotten we've we've pretty well defined, you know, what that skill set is. Uh, and then we were just fortunate that we already had that within our organization. Um, we have a question up front, but while the microphone is coming up, hold up your hand, please. While the mic is coming up, uh, I used to know a four-star general who was the head of a combatant command, and he said something very similar to what you just said, which is he liked the ability that networks gave him to, um, and I'm gonna put words in his mouth, bypass the chain of command and go up and down the chain and talk to enlisted people and the whole bit. And in talking to the people between him and the enlisted ranks, they hated it. So um, how does that work in the Coast Guard? What the, how's that changing your organizational culture, if it's changing it at all? I've done everything I can to flatten it uh, and, and to be transparent. So I have a, an outward-looking public Facebook page, mm -hmm. Instagram, Twitter. Uh, and so a number of our Coast Guard men and women follow me on Facebook. Uh, and and I open, I, I'm open to these very frank and open dialogues of, of what they're seeing in their world, uh, because otherwise that may be my blind spot. Uh, otherwise, I'm the emperor with no clothes. Um, so the good news is, you know, my workforce will call me out if I'm the emperor with no clothes. <laughs> Kind of a frightening thought. It is. Did, go ahead. Uh, James Leitner, Academy Class of 61. So we were lucky to have slide rules also. <laughs> uh, I teach at Hawaii Community College. I'm wondering what uh, the community colleges can do to be able to stimulate interest in cyber. It's especially attractive that they don't have to be rotated every two years. Yeah. They're doing a lot. Uh, you know, we have a number of, of centers of, of expertise. And that's the talent pool that I need to look at. Uh, I'm going to be looking at them, <coughs> excuse me, as are a number of others. You know, this is clearly a, a growth industry, you know, for, for our young minds of today um, that, that thrive in this environment. So the, their growth potential, hiring potential is enormous. OK, 
Okay. But I'll be waiting in line, among others, to bring those folks aboard. I think we had one in the front. Oh, no, we got one in the back. Uh, yes, my name is Matt Campbell. I'm with IBM. Uh, Admiral, uh, you do have an existing and ongoing uh, intelligence lifecycle, non-cyber, if you will. I'm curious to know if you view the cyber intelligence lifecycle as, and systems and groups that enable that as being a modification of your existing groups or something entirely different? The two are really interwoven uh, when I look at cyber and, and intel. Uh, when I look at the systems um, that, that provide the archiving of, of information, more importantly, it's not the archiving. And that's kind of a dangerous term when you talk intel, because if it's ar archived, that means it's stovepiped. Uh, and, and then it's not shared across the interagency. Uh, ironically, just before this meeting, I chair the interdiction committee within the Office of the National Drug Control Policy, where we look at how do we share information at the state, local, federal, tribal, international levels when it comes to combating transnational crime. And so cyber is a key enabler in doing this. Uh, we work very closely with the national intelligence community that have identified collaborative systems to be able to cross map much of this information, even our ability to share this with international partners. So the, the two are, are intricately woven. Uh, you know, one is the information, but the second is the domain and the systems that, that provide that level of awareness. Uh, and that is the cyber domain that does it for us. On that note, um, so Coast Guard does uh, collect intelligence and they have an intelligence mission. Where does the cyber strategy fit into that? Does it affect collection? Do you see the people you're uh, working against using things like encryption? What's, what's the environment for the, the other side that you have to deal with? Yeah. Uh, well, certainly it, it's going to be a much more challenging environment when you look at it, encrypted devices, but as a member of the national intelligence community, I use that case that I alluded to earlier. Uh, the fact that we can track down six ships spread over an area of, of several hundred thousand miles and then vector aircraft and <coughs> ships uh, to, to interdict and then arrest and ultimately prosecute those individuals, all of that is enabled by intelligence. Uh, so cyber is the key enabler. Do our adversaries exercise good cyber hygiene? They'll look at this strategy as well and recognize they would look at that exact same model. We need to protect our cyber domain. We need it to enable our operations. And we need to protect our critical infrastructure. So, so this template, if you will, for a strategy, yes, it applies if you're private public sector. Unfortunately, it also applies if you're one of our adversaries as well. We do not want to be found in the cyber domain. Uh, we had one in the front, I think. Sydney Freeberg again. Uh, Admiral, one thing you've talked about is cyber hygiene, the importance of keeping people from doing dumb things that let bad things into the network. But when I talk to folks on the DOD side, I hear over and over again, you know, you can't count on perimeter defense alone. You have to assume that someone will do something dumb or that someone bad will do something very smart and that the adversary will be in your network to some degree all the time. And the question is managing uh, rather than preventing and being aware of your internal health of the system, not just saying we will stop them all at the frontier. So to what degree is that kind of internal defense, active defense, layered defense, part of your strategy and your thinking uh, with a relatively small number of people to do it with? The real challenge is you, know, you end up with single points of failure. You, know, you could have 99.9% .9 compliance uh, and then you know, one individual. And look what a Snowden did to, to our, our, our credibility uh, in the level of that compromise. You know, one individual, you know, and this is malicious. Um, so th those are the real challenges that you face. I mean, part of that's in our screening process of who you bring into your organization um, and who do you issue a CAT card to that provides them unfettered access to our domain. So we need to think a little bit longer and smarter about how we do that. But the truth of the matter is, uh, you know, this is an organizational failure. You know, this, these are single points of failure. And I'm a relatively small service with, with 88,000 
active civilian reserve and Coast Guard Auxiliary, but all it takes is one out of that 88,000 uh, that can potentially harm our enterprise in a significant way. And that is a real challenge for all of us. Uh, Caroline Howard, sir, Coast Guard Auxiliary. I was wondering in regards to the strategic needs in the cyber domain, how you plan to stay abreast of rapidly innovating new technological developments that will render old ones and old plans obsolete. So innovation is, is a cornerstone of, of my vision for the Coast Guard. Uh, the, the fact is we've got a lot of people that, that embrace the, this new technology and they're in it as well. We need to think a little bit about how we develop the future of the Coast Guard. We do you know, industry uh, exchanges with the maritime industry, for example. So the industry we regulate, people spend a year in that community, and then they come back to the Coast Guard. But we need to look at the same thing within, within Google, Intel, Excel, and some of the others, and, and look at doing professional development you know, exchanges, you know, industry training with the industry so we can stay current with what's evolving in that industry as we're looking at best management practices. You know, what better place to look at than to be able to plug our folks uh, to do internships within these organizations, recognizing they're very mindful of their proprietary information. Um, but I think that's the next step that we need to look, look at is how do we develop the next generation of Coast Guard because in years past, you know, all the great ideas came from the military. The internet came from the military. Well, the IT world has flourished, and, and some of the best minds are out there as they're looking at new applications. So I think it would be to our benefit as we look at how do we then do industry exchange with this very tech-savvy industry that I'm still trying to fully comprehend. This is a little geeky, so I apologize, but I spent the morning with a bunch of uh, CFOs from big companies, and one of the things that they think about when they think about cybersecurity is uh, mobile devices and what we used to call BYOD, bring your own device. And this indicated, it created uh, what one of them called, I think he was quoting Keith Alexander, sort of an unprotected flank for their enterprise. So when you think about mobile devices, do you let people use them? Do you, can you stop people from using them? Where do they fit into what you're uh, doing with this strategy? Yeah, well, certainly if you're working with you know, anything that's classified in nature, you, know, you check your device at the door. Uh, and and we're, we're very attentive to mm -hmm. checking those devices at the door. Uh, when I've been deployed on ships and we have information on a late breaking case, uh, we have the ability to, to shoot email off a ship, but just like in electronic warfare, you set you know, emission controls so people can't transmit off the ship, uh, can't email their significant other, hey, we're chasing down a go fast right now, uh, because I have no assurance that that information has just been compromised. Uh, and we are constantly monitored in our transmissions, and I get a weekly report, and I see where that failure to exercise good cyber hygiene is lacking. Uh, the next step is seriously holding those members accountable. Uh, so I, I get red in the face. I said, you know, boy, am I upset, and then I cool off by the end of the week until the next report comes out on Monday, and then it keeps my blood pressure high for the rest of the week. But until we actually start looking at, you know, holding individuals accountable uh, for what are really flagrant breaches, um, I think it will be very difficult to change some of this behavior. Hmm. What do you, when you say accountability, what do you mean? I love mobile okay. devices. I was in an exercise where it was out in a desert area, and... Uh, we were able to see 10,000 uh, cell phones move all in a coordinated fashion, and that was a really useful hint as to what was going on. W when you talk about accountability, it's very hard to tell 10,000 people, hey, turn off your cell phone. Not impossible. What do you do when you say accountability? Do you go to the commanding officer? Do you go to the uh, lower than that? How does it work? Uh, it really needs to be handled at the field unit level. Mm -hmm. the, the commanding officer, in all likelihood, is not going to have awareness mm -hmm. that, that a leak originated at their unit. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll probably be at, at our cyber command or through others, uh, NSA in particular, that provide me a weekly report and say, this unit divulged this information. Uh, and then they pushed it into a non-secure internet provider. Uh, so first, you know, our folks need to be aware of the mm. fact that you will not do this. Uh, I can't hold somebody accountable if they're not aware of what the ground rules are. So mm. the first piece of this is we need to lay out the ground rules. 
and this gets back to the question back uh, that we had earlier. I mean, it really comes down to you know, training and then retraining. And if you're going to be operating on any one of our systems, there needs to be recurrent training you know, in there as well. But I'm not convinced that doing online training and then passing the test at the end of the day uh, provides you that, that full sense of appreciation of what would happen if you compromised that system. Okay. Uh, we've got time for one more. Well, we have time for three more, if you're willing. And we have time for four more, and that's absolutely it. Okay. Uh, go ahead in the front there. Hello, my name is Les Olson. I'm with Computer Sciences Corporation out of Falls Church, Virginia. My question is, is have you heard of and do you plan to use um, in, uh, the Navy um, CyberSafe program? Have you heard of that? I'm looking at the person next to you shaking his head vigorously up and down. Yes. <laughs> so the answer Very is much yes. so. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and so with that, the cyber awakening uh, for the Navy. Uh, I was just wondering, do you plan to use kind of that model that the Navy is looking to integrate uh, for cybersecurity? Uh, all that good stuff, though. So. Yes, nice. <laughs> Love it. Thank you. How are you, dinner? Uh, we got one over there, and then we got a couple in the back, and that'll be it. Hi, uh, my name is Sterling Schrader, and I'm an intern for Congressman Will Hurd. Um, I was viewing the OPM hearings earlier uh, with the Homeland Security. And I was wondering, how efficient are your 70-person team at finding all the problems once there has been a hack that occurs because you can't have 100% um, hygiene when it comes to cybersecurity? We're good. Yeah, we're very good at monitoring our systems. Uh, we certainly don't have the capacity to go out and, and monitor everybody others. So, I mean, this is very internally looking. First of all, looking at our systems. The next piece of this is going to be, you know, what are those standards? Yeah, what are you know an independent research lab best management practices uh, that then we could then transmit to industry uh, as you know not mandatory but these are best management practices. We did something very similar with IMO when it came to piracy. It wasn't required, but if you had a privately armed security team on your ship, there's a good likelihood that pirates will never get on board that ship. And the ships that carried these, there were over 200 attacks against those ships. And guess what? Not one pirate gained access. So if you have something very similar, you know, what are those best management practices? And then how do we disseminate that to industry as well? But they're certainly very eager to hear what those are. Oh, my goodness. Why does this always happen at the end? Uh, why don't we get the two, Jacob, right by you? I will say that if you look at the, how the cybersecurity industry is changing, one of the things that will be different a year or two from now is that there will be much better technology for detecting um, intrusion threat activity, not based on signatures, finding the threats that are better hidden than what we've seen in the past. So this might be an area to watch. Go ahead. Admiral, uh, very good uh, remarks today. In December, the Coast Guard uh, published in the uh, uh, Federal Register a call up uh, for information from the uh, industry in helping them prepare a cybersecurity standard. Uh, uh, how is that going and what are the next steps? We've had uh, two outreach events uh, and with each one we've had in excess of, of, of 300 people show up. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you do, and this is not a, a notice, you know, advance notice of proposed rulemaking, uh, but this is just bringing industry to the table uh, to understand their concerns. Uh, but this is, again, a, a very lively area of discussion right now. So with that announcement, we hosted two meetings here in the D.C. area. We need to continue this outreach as well. Uh, we had one of these events just recently, a week ago in New York. Uh, with the Air and Maritime Security Committee. We had 300 people show up for that as well. Do you have, we're at the witching hour. Do you have time for a couple more or? We can take two more. Okay, well, we got one there and one there and that's it. We've had one over here for a while. Oh, we did we? I can't see him. Oh, okay. we'll, we'll get him okay. then, I'm sorry. Admiral, um, <clears throat> we talked today about resiliency and you mentioned GPS as a single point of failure. How does the proposal that's out there to revamp the Loran C sites into enhanced Loran or E-Loran fit in? Are you looking at that in terms of your cyber strategy? How does that all fit in with what you're proposing, to, what you're talking about today? That would really be part of a national strategy. 
Um, because really, you know, some of the critical element of a Moran signal, which is very difficult to jam, uh, is the timing system that, that comes with that Moran signal. Uh, now, we have intentionally kept several of those Moran transmitter sites uh, in place in the event they needed to be reactivated. Uh, technically, we could have taken all of the transmitter sites, including those antennas, uh, down. So we're looking at this, but really not for Coast Guard, uh, but really as an instrument of national policy. And certainly, we would be an enabler, but not something that would be you know, uniquely Coast Guard owned as the Loran Sea chain was uh, prior to it being taken down. We've got the, thank yeah. you for being patient. Thanks, Adam. We'll see. I appreciate your unobstructed view from the bridge up there. <laughs> uh, Will Watson, Maritime Security Council. Uh, we know the Coast Guard has got a very robust presence at the IMO and that you work closely with the international uh, commercial maritime community on a lot of these kinds of programs, but unfortunately that's a particularly slow process. Is the Coast Guard working directly with any of the major flag states, uh, Panama, Liberia, Mar Marshall Islands, et cetera, that flag most of the vessels that call on U.S. ports on these issues? Work in, it, that is a work in progress, and so that was my interest in going out to North Shipping in, in Oslo last week. I will attend IMO uh, this November in, in London uh, to continue this dialogue as well to see if there is not interest uh, in moving this into the ISPIS code. But as you well appreciate, things don't move at the speed of light. Uh, so I look at industry it is going to take this upon themselves um, and not necessarily wait to be regulated, but this is really good self-regulation, if you will, to protect their financial interests. Uh, another element, and I think this may come into play at some point in time, you know, will you need cyber liability insurance? Yeah. So if you're shipping from point A to point B and either the terminal's not accessible or your vessel has had a, a terminal uh, disruption uh, because of a cyber hack, uh, that will be the next, perhaps, area to look at, you know, do you need cyber liability insurance? Uh, something to, to think of as well. So if you start looking at financial incentives to do that, uh, I think industry may take this on uh, in advance of being provided best practices from IMO. Okay, last one. We had one over there. Great. Admiral, I'm John Wortman. I'm the past chair of the Coalition of Geospatial Organizations. Uh, about a year ago, General Dempsey was over here at Brookings, and he spoke about cybersecurity from a DOD-wide perspective. He was asked if he ever envisioned a scenario under which a conventional response might be needed for a cyber attack. How do you think about that in this new age of cyber warfare? I think that would be very difficult, I think for the reason that I alluded to earlier, because the, uh, the ability to assign 100% attribution to an adversary short of a, a very overt attack from a, a state or non-state actor to say, we are going to infiltrate your system. Um, so if that's you know, in, in response to an attack. Uh, clearly, if you look at what's happening within ISIL and, and their ability to exploit social media uh, to recruit activists, uh, a, a great concern. Uh, you know, what is our ability to compromise that recruitment effort? So it, it, when I start looking at how cyber is being used in different applications, um, but if we're using it in an offensive capability in response to an attack against us, that 100% attribution may be a little bit difficult. Uh, the other piece to look at, and we have not thought this through, of well, what do you do about the ability of ISIL to do recruitment in social media, and they've been able to do so to, to great effect, uh, and to protect their identity in doing this as well. So I see this as a very challenging domain, especially if we're looking for a conventional response to a cyber event. Proceed with caution. <laughs> well, this has been a great session. Thank you so much for coming to see okay. us. Okay.